day, everyone, and welcome to our virtual session on transforming development indicator collection in the age of social distancing. I'm Bobby Berkowitz, analytics specialist at Finmark Trust. I focus on new analytic tools users can adapt for their needs. I will be moderating today, introduce you to our speakers, respondents, and manage your feedback and questions through the session. Today, we have a broad audience for the pre-recording. You have the opportunity to chat and pose questions in the Q&A box as shown on the bottom of your screens. Please post your questions under the Q&A function during this webinar. There will also be online ch chat functionality during the UN World Data Forum in October. Yes. This webinar falls under the UN World Data Forum thematic area two, which is about innovations and synergies across data ecosystems. The purpose of this theme is bringing together different data communities and building collaboration between national statistical offices and other producers of data. What is important is how these data partnerships with national statistical systems will develop new skills, transfer technology, and cover gaps in measuring the 2030 agenda, ultimately to improve the lives of people. Now to introduce our team. Shirley Jeffries Leach is a senior specialist at Finmark Trust. Shirley leads the COVID-19 Africa tracker program in seven African markets. She led the sustainable data collection program that forms the basis of this webinar, testing mobile phone technology as the primary tool for data collection. Jonathan Geller is statistician at Mathematica. He is an expert in causal inference, predictive modeling, and the analysis of survey data. Jonathan has a PhD in biostatistics from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Constance Delanoy is pursuing a PhD in applied mathematics at the University of Colorado Boulder. She pre previously worked at Mathematica as a data scientist in policy evaluation. We are also fortunate to be joined by directors from both the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics and the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics. Both Matthew Collins Amondi and Rabia Awan are responsible for census and other large-scale benchmark household surveys, as well as sustainable development goal reporting. Tell you about the structure of today's webinar. Shirley is going to start and she's going to take us through how the approach that we take you through makes sustainable development goal, that is SDG indicator collection more accessible. Our application to COVID-19 tracking, our full innovative cost effective approach for normal times and the underlying technical approach that combines different modes of data collection and what the underlying methodological challenges are. Shirley will then hand over to John, who will briefly take us through the underlying technical approach and implementation of MRP, which stands for multi-level regression and post-stratification. Uh, from there, Constance will show how well our innovative approach combining multi mobile data collection with limited face-to-face -face data collection works. And this sets, up, sets, us, sets us up well to see why the approach provides a practical cost-effective solution to SDG and other development indicator reporting. Our representatives from KNBS, which is the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, and PBS, which is the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics, will then respond. And then we will take your questions. Uh, I now hand over to Shirley. So, as Bobby mentioned, we began our journey of sustainable data collection a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was really our mandate was to collect uh, key performance indicators at a low cost. Traditional, traditional research and development in the development space has focused on long and complex in-person surveys, which are logistically heavy and very expensive to run. We set out to find an alternative, uh, an alternative that allowed for the measurement of specific indicators in a more sustainable way. The challenge was both to explore alternatives to in-person surveys, leveraging technology to reach a wide, as wide an audience as possible and design surveys fit for the mode of data collection and the purpose of tracking indicators. So in essence, taking something that's traditionally been quite complex and detailed and making it simple, straightforward and sustainable. You can really see that there are still many gaps in the data available on this SDG indicators. All of the indicators are, are listed below the sustainable development goal um, that they apply to in this image. And those that are highlighted in, in yellow and red are those where there's not enough information or there's no information available on that indicator. But of course, tracking these indicators is difficult. 
there's a lot of things to track and data collection can take significant resources that could be applied elsewhere. A more sustainable approach to indicator tracking is an opportunity. And the method we'll uh, outline can, can be used to unlock more data across the SDGs. Some of the gaps uh, shown on this slide can't be answered with, with demand side surveys. However, there are actually many indicators that we can use this method to leverage. For example, rural road access, violence, recycling rates, informal, employ uh, uh, informal employment, safe drinking water, land ownership, and poverty. Our method leverages a mix of different modes of data collection, with the majority of da data collection being, used, uh, being done using, the mobile, using mobile technology. So SMS surveys are where you use text messages that contain the full question and answer um, to survey people. So it gets sent out as a question, question with answer options as an SMS, and people can reply via text to that message. So it's in, in essence, a self-complete survey. And it's a really affordable way to reach a, very, a, a wide audience of people. CATI interviews, um, which stands for Computer Aided Telephonic Interviewing, are conducted via the telephone, where an interviewer calls and talks to a respondent and captures their, their responses over the phone. And we've conclusively established that the use of mobile technology reduces the cost of indicator collection. But we also know that there are limitations in coverage using the mobile method. Most obviously that only those people who have mobile phones can be reached. This means that the inclusion of some face-to-face -face data, uh, where, uh, which is where interviewers go into people's homes and survey them face-to-face, is necessary to ensure representation of those people who are most vulnerable. The success of a mixed method is highly dependent on the quality of input data that we, that we can use for our survey design and ultimately our weighting. There is a sample optimization opportunity here where existing household surveys um, information can be used in each market to optimize sample design and to take into account unique market differences in terms of, for example, coverage of mobile phones, and ideally specifically information relating to the SDGs of interest. The aim would be to create, be, would be to create a blended sample that's both robust and affordable, that gives us the greatest accuracy and precision at a sustainable cost. We do have some general rules of thumb that we have found to be effective in sample blending, but there is an opportunity to use more context specific information to decrease bias beyond what we have as yet achieved. A key starting point is to develop a detailed understanding of the mo mobile coverage in markets of interest and relating this to factors that we know influence inclusion in, in mobile phone surveys, for instance, level of education. So having some baseline information specific to particular SDGs or an area of inquiry can, can be analyzed by mobile phone and ownership and usage, and that would be ideal. It would aid us with both sample design and weighting and with content and survey optimization to ensure that the information gathered on different modes accounts for the notion that people may respond differently depending on the mode of collection and their own technological engagement. Adding these elements to household surveys, such as an income and expenditure survey or a census, will increase the power of this alternative method for indicator collection and tracking. So to start with, I'm actually gonna show you um, the use of mobile technology for our COVID-19 tracking um, and what we have uh, done and learned in this recent history uh, with our COVID-19 tracker. So early on in this, uh, this year, when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was just starting to spread across um, the globe and um, entering Africa, we were set to ch the challenge to develop and, and run a multi-country tracker where we really looked at um, indicators around um, health, financials, earnings, food security, and people's perceptions of their own safety. We run the we're running this study in seven markets. Um, those are Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Rwanda, South Africa, Uganda, and Zambia. 
And we've really been working hand in hand with our financial sector deepening agency partners across the continent. The data is freely available um, for anyone who wants to go and uh, view it and download it. It's available at the website that's shown on the screen, um, www.covid19tracker.africa. We started surveying on this uh, in early April, um, and we really wanted to get into the field as fast as possible and out again so that we could really have data as close to the moment as possible. So Bobby and I had a lot of sleepless nights trying to, to get this done as quickly as possible, but it, there really is a big payoff in being able to, to collect and deliver data really quickly. The data is being used by many different stakeholders um, and for many different purposes. And just some examples of things that are being done is, as for, uh, for example, the Office of the Presidency in Kenya uh, is being informed with the data from, from our tracker. Uh, in addition, many NGOs across the continent um, are, are using the data um, and looking to respond to COVID-19 based on what they are learning from, from the data collected in our tracker. And further, it's also being used in academia. There's a great deal of insight that's come out of our tracker, um, but I'm not going to go into to all of it. I'm just going to focus on one specific um, point of, of uh, insight coming out in terms of livelihoods and the destruction thereof. Well, what's really interesting to see, this data comes from mid-June, is the, the impact that the virus is having on people's livelihoods in terms of loss of income. When we think about people who have lost their jobs, we can see that um, in Uganda, Kenya, and Rwanda, significant portions of the population have actually lost their jobs since March the, March the 1st. Um, but what's also interesting there is that even in Nigeria, where only 1% have lost their jobs, that actually does translate into a million people losing their jobs in Nigeria. And then what's actually more significant is to actually consider that people's incomes are getting smaller based uh, on the effect of COVID-19 and economic shutdowns. So a significant portion of people in all countries actually claim that their incomes are smaller than they were a year ago. This is something that will need to be, to be co conscious of and to watch going forward to see what the long-term implications of people losing so much of their livelihood are. But again, the method itself also makes this kind of tracking a really um, valuable exercise because it allows you to turn things around really, really quickly. With in-person surveys, you typically need to, to spend a lot of time sending people out into the field, determining the logistics to get people to particular locations, to collect data, to bring them back. Um, and that takes time and it takes resources. When we use the mobile phone, we can get to people in the moment. And um, what that, that meant for us is we could also really understand using a tracking, to, uh, tracking method, how different um, levels of lockdown had an influence on, on people's lives and their livelihoods. So, in South Africa, we have been under lockdown for uh, nearly 200 days now. And, but it's been in differing, differing levels of severity. So we started off with what was called level five lockdown, which had very high restrictions and kept us in our homes. Um, we were only allowed to go out if we had uh, a medical emergency or we needed to go and buy food at a grocery store. And then, um, we moved to a lower level where some of those restrictions were lifted and um, now we've currently, we're currently in what's called level one, which means that life has mostly gone back to normal. The real restrictions now are on social gatherings and there's uh, social distancing uh, rules in place where we need to wear masks in public and um, follow things like getting our, having our hands sanitized or having our temperatures read before entering particular premises. And as this, the levels of, of restriction changed, we could be there in the field um, surveying people to see how different levels 
of lockdown actually influenced their lives and their livelihoods. But of course, this has all been in the time of COVID-19. And as I mentioned, we were really looking at using strengths from different mixing methodologies. But in the time of COVID-19, we of course can't use face-to-face -face surveys because social distancing meant that we, it was not really responsible to send people into communities who could potentially during the, the highest peak of the, of the pandemic, actually put their, put their own lives in danger and then also potentially spread the, the disease into the communities where we were surveying. So we couldn't use a face-to-face -face, uh, sample. Um, and because we couldn't use a face-to-face -face sample, we actually opted to go with telephonic interviewing as our, um, as our source. The reason we didn't go with SMS, um, although it would have been very nice to, to have SMS because it's so affordable, we would have been able to survey m more people than we have with our um, telephonic method, which is slightly more expensive. Um, but the limitation of not being, not being able to reach those people who don't have mobile phones is actually exacerbated further with the SMS survey because you again, you can't reach those people who are not literate enough to actually participate in a self-complete survey. Of course, that being said, the information that we've gathered in the piloting and work that we've been doing on our sustainable data collection program has actually taught us a lot about who we actually do reach uh, in using the different method methods or modes of data collection. And um, looking at the data on the screen now, what you can see is that um, we used a poverty measurement and the, the figures showing are those people who claim to be living below the poverty line. And what you can see here is that although in some markets we underread, generally we're actually getting quite a, a large portion of people who actually are in that um, lower uh, tier of society where they are living below the poverty line. And then if we actually go into a, a more detailed look just specifically in Nigeria and think about particular cohorts that would be of interest to us, for example, women and people living in rural areas, as we know these people are most vulnerable. This really demonstrates where the CATI uh, mode uh, is, a, is a good option in that when we compare it to the face-to-face -face sample, we really, with women and people in rural er areas, we get a very similar, or in fact, the same uh, proportion of our sample who are uh, in, those area, uh, in those cohorts. And then what's really critical here is looking at the low literacy figures. And this is really why going with a CATI option we felt was a better option for the COVID-19 tracker than SMS. And that's because people's self-claim uh, self on low literacy is significantly a higher portion of people in our telephonic interview are those people who claim they don't have very good li levels of literacy. Um, I'm sure it's unsurprising that in the SMS that is not the case. So what did that actually mean for the results that we got? We included a data validation question in our COVID-19 survey so that we could really see what what, was the, what were the implications of using a different mode to collect data? And what you're looking at on the screen now is uh, the dark blue bars are the financial sector deepening agencies estimates from 2018 on those people who have a registered bank or mobile money account. And then the light blue bar is the COVID-19 trackers estimate of, the, of that figure. And if we start by looking at Kenya, the, well, some of the, the, the difference could actually be explained by the, the difference in time because uh, the FSD estimates are from 2018 and our track is from 2020. But when you see the size of the gaps, you can say that I think not everything is explained by the time lapse. In Kenya, you can see that we have a 10% gap between the FSD uh, official estimate and the, um, our credible interval on the COVID-19 tracker. And that may be a time-lapse difference. 
But when we start to look at Nigeria and Uganda, we start to see that gap grows. In Nigeria, the gap is 18%, and in Uganda, the gap is 38%. But what's important to understand here is the context of each market in terms of mobile phone penetration. Because although estimates for mobile phone penetration are very hard to come by in terms of what's actually accurate, and there are many different sources with many different numbers, the mo most sources um, state that in Kenya, mobile phone subscription is at 80% of the population or more. Whereas in Nigeria, these figures can vary between about 50% of the population and 80% of the population have access to and use a mobile phone. And in Uganda, the estimates are typically between 40 and 50%. So what this really means is that the, the more mobile phones there are in a market, the better the, the mobile only approach would be. But of course, there is more <laughs> to this methodological challenge. And we really, um, for normal times that are not COVID times, we, we have come to a really pleasing solution that we are quite happy to share with you today. So there's different modes of data collection and I've spoken briefly to some of them. Um, in, um, but, and based on that, you may be tempted to say that in-person face-to-face surveys are better than other methods. But there's actually, that's not as simple as that. There are differences and each have their own strengths and, and weaknesses. So as an example, when you use a self-complete survey, you remove an interviewer effect. And if we wanted to do something like indicator tracking on um, gender-based violence, removing an interviewer from your survey could actually give you a lot better a result or more honest result from, from the participant. But we do know that in-person surveys can be more, more complex. They can have more uh, detail in the surveys. The questionnaires can be lengthy and give us paint a, a really detailed picture of people's lives for us. And the sampling is, is really robust and we really do get to, we are able to reach everyone in society. But on the other end of the spectrum, SMS surveys have a significantly reduced cost. So we have access to more data. We can collect data on more things uh, if we aren't having to lay out such a big investment. And then, with SMS surveys and to an extent uh, CATI surveys, there is an element of simplicity there that may be seen as a weakness by some, but I would actually argue as a, a key strength of these, of these mobile methods of data collection because they really force us to be very targeted and specific in how we survey people. The questions that we ask need to be brief to the point and we need to make, they need to be very clear and easy for people to understand which ultimately should be give it, giving us better data from people as they fully understand what we're asking and they also um, don't get tired from a very long survey. So we took quite a few steps to get to the method that we're um, at now. And um, I'll talk you through them quite briefly. Um, we started off with some pre-pilots where we really wanted to test the capabilities of the mobile method. We wanted to know what could we ask on an SMS survey? What level of um, uh, information can we actually get from something that is simplified? Um, but then in addition to that, what did the sample look like? What would it mean for the precision of our estimates to be going to a mobile phone sample? and who would we actually be, be picking up. And we were quite happy with the results that we got from our pre-pilots. In terms of, of survey design, the, the instrument itself, the questionnaires that we can ask, we were quite pleased with how much you can actually do with the limited um, technology. And in terms of the sample itself, we did also pick up those people who are um, more marginalized or vulnerable in society. So we knew that they were there in the data, but they weren't 
represented in full and we they were there in smaller numbers than what we would ideally want them to be. So going forward, we decided to do a mixed methodology to leverage the best of of face to face and the best of the mobile technologies that we could so that we could really develop a sustainable mixed method approach. And we did things in our mixed method pilots to really give us the best possible results. For example, we conducted cognitive interviewing on the survey before we went into field to make sure that it really was a true reflection of the people's lives um, that we were recording. And then once we had gathered our data, we went into um, the, our next step, which was analysis. And um, there'll be quite a lot more detail on how we did our analysis coming up shortly in the, in the presentation. But really, the result of our sustainable data collection pilots were very pleasing. And um, you'll remember a few slides ago, I showed you the results of um, using our validation question in the COVID-19 tracker. This is the, the exact same question, that question on um, having a registered mobile money or bank account. And what is being compared here is a 2017 estimate from the Financial Inclusion in Insights Survey in each of these markets, which is a nationally representative sample, um, a large scale face-to-face -face survey. And then the final result that came out from our sustainable data collection pilot on this measure. And what you can see there is with the method that we applied, our results from the pilot are within the interval on all, uh, in all three markets, even Uganda, where we know that there's a low penetration of mobile phone ownership. So I'm going to now hand over to John, who's going to talk you through actually what the method is for bringing the data together and how it works. Okay. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, the statistical challenge that we're trying to solve here is how to get valid estimates of indicators for the full population when our data systematically underrepresents certain demographics group, certain demographic groups. Uh, so this is, of course, not a new problem. Uh, the traditional way this is handled, uh, this issue is handled, is to design a survey so that you know the probability that each person uh, who participates in the model uh, in the survey would be selected. Uh, so this is known as design-based inference. Uh, but design-based inference doesn't apply to our situation. It's really for two reasons. One, we don't have the design information for the sample. Uh, we can kind of think of uh, our SMS surveys as a convenient sample. Uh, and we are, and the people that respond are, are, um, are those, uh, those that uh, end up uh, participating in the study. And the second reason is even if we did have this design information, we expect such high rates of non-response non -response that we could pretty much uh, throw that design information out the window because uh, uh, with such high response rates, um, the, uh, the design information isn't going to be very helpful. So instead, we need some sort of a model-based adjustment. Um, there are a number of model-based approaches that have been developed. Uh, uh, here we list just three of them, um, but the essential idea behind all of these model-based approaches is that they use observed differences between the sampled population and the target population or the national population to adjust uh, estimates. So observed difference on different covariates, like difference in their age, gender, education level, et cetera. So uh, just briefly, some of the common approaches that exist in the literature are, are one is a inverse probability weighting or matching. Um, and here uh, you are trying to essentially use propensity score methods to replicate those design-based uh, probabilities, trying to, to estimate those design probabilities the best you can through a propensity score uh, type model, uh, and you can either use weighting or, or matching approaches there. This is sometimes known as quasi-randomization, uh, where you get these uh, uh, these prob these uh, sort of pseudo design weights. Uh, the second method is iterative proportional fitting, um, which is more commonly known as raking. And here, uh, it's also a weighting-based approach. You're trying to find these weights where, uh, if you take these weights, the there are the weights that if you, uh, if you take weighted averages of de the demographics in your sample, they will match the target population. So find the best possible weights that allow that to, to happen at the margins. So what that means is that uh, 
is that if you take a weighted average of the percent of your population that's 35, uh, 35 to 45 years old, it matches that rate in the target population. You take the weighted average of the people that, that completed high school, that matches the target population. Uh, the third method that we highlight here is uh, model-based post-stratification most model-based post-stratification, um, more specifically multi-level regression with post-stratification or MRP. Uh, so here, uh, the idea is that you're, we're gonna fit a Bayesian regression model to estimate the relationship between respondent characteristics and outcomes. And then we're gonna use that model to predict the outcomes for the target population. Uh, next slide. So uh, what is MRP? Uh, MRP is sometimes called Mr. P. Um, it's an approach for obtaining estimates from surveys and some have called it the gold standard uh, in estimating preference from national surveys. Uh, the approach has a pretty long history. It dates back to the 1960s where, uh, where it was used uh, by Poole, Abelson and Popkin to try to predict the winner of the U.S. presidential election. I think the 1964 U.S. presidential election. Uh, they they used the an early version of this approach, but the modern implementation really owes itself to a series of papers uh, by Andrew Gelman, uh, especially this one Gel uh, Gelman and Little 1997, and they're the ones that gave it the uh, the name uh, multi-level regression with post stratification, and it's now it's widely used across the social science now, um, in particular for p political polling because that's where its root where its roots are. Um, so again, MRP, it's a model-based post-stratification method. The, the main idea is that we're performing this adjustment for non-representative sampling uh, at a micro level, uh, much more so than, uh, some, than a procedure like raking. And because of this, we require a reference survey uh, with detailed information on the target population. Now, that, that doesn't mean we need to have information on every single person that lives in the country, but we do need a good relatively large reference survey like a census. Uh, so we have some sort of uh, detail about the target population. Next slide. So MRP can be boiled down into a three-step process. Uh, first, we divide the population into what we call cells. And these are uh, different groups that are defined by uh, whatever, what we think are the important demographic characteristics that we are associate, that are associated with outcomes. Uh, the, we then fit what's called a multi-level regression model to estimate the outcome in each cell. Uh, if you're not familiar with this term, multi-level regression model, uh, these are models that are set up uh, uh, so that the information from smaller groups, so some, some of these smaller cells can inform uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, so that the information from smaller cells can be informed in part from the information from the larger cells where there's where we have a larger sample. So this this is called borrowing of strength. So we borrow the small, the, the cells where we don't have a lot of information borrow strength from similar cells that we do have more information from. And the last step um, of the procedure is called post stratification where we use information about the target population, about who makes up the, pop, the target population, and we take this weighted average of the cell-specific estimates to get our final estimate for the entire population. Uh, so let's go through a quick example uh, to try to understand how this works. Um, let's suppose that uh, we are interested in knowing uh, this indicator, do you use, uh, the we wanna know the proportion of the population that uses mobile banking in a particular country. So the first step is to create these cells. Um, in this case, we're going to, in this simple example, we're just going to be using two demographic variables, gender and uh, urbanicity to define uh, the cells. And that gives us four cells, which is the cross between these two binary uh, variables. Um, uh, next, uh, we will fit a multi-level regression model to, uh, to estimate the rates in each of these four cells. And that's what we, we see here. We fit a model, this multi-level regression model, it's, uh, you can think of it as a uh, logistic regression model uh, with, that includes two variables, um, gender and urbanicity. It could also include their interaction to uh, estimate these four numbers. Now in this simple case, we could have just looked at our sample, looked at female rural members, and looked at what the proportion of, of them that uh, use mobile banking is, look at each of the four cells separately. But as we'll see, uh, um, when we get to more complicated scenarios where we have more, post, more of these 
um, we have more cells and more variables, there might be little to no sample in each of those cells. So the model, and we'll see how the multi-level, we'll explain how the multi-level regression model helps to get those estimates there. And then in the final step next, Shirley, uh, we will bring in information on the population. So suppose that we know that 35% of the population is uh, rural women, 35% rural men, 15% urban women, 15% urban men. We take that information, uh, this comes from some, our, some sort of reference survey, and then we apply it to uh, our cell specific estimates and we take a weighted average to get our final estimate, uh, in this case, 60%. Next. Uh, so MRP has a number of uh, it advantages uh, over some other, over alternative approaches. One is that, uh, so because we're using this Bayesian regression model and these, uh, we have priors that prevent overfitting. So what that means is that we can include more of these demographic predictors to get more finer and finer cells. And we, and we don't overfit to just the small sample that is in that cell. Uh, we also use a, a flexible regression model. We can include interactions to get more specific information about those cells. We can do fancy things like spatial smoothing if we want. We can, we can do a lot more with this. We can get as fancy as we want with the regression model. Uh, the second advantage of MRP is uh, it, it's sort of related to the Bayesian priors. Uh, they, they allow us to borrow strength across similar cells. So that if there's cells where we have no information on or we have very few observations there, those uh, estimates are informed in part by, this, by similar cells that share some of the same demographic features, um, but, not, but not all of them. And so it borrows strength across them. That gives more stable estimates. So that, for example, if there's just one observation that uh, the estimate for that cell is not either 100% or 0%. It, uh, it stabilizes and gives more reasonable estimates for, uh, for those. It also um, is an efficient method where uh, we end up decreasing variance uh, through this approach. Third advantage is that it's easy to quantify uncertainty uh, in these models. Bayesian regression models are known to propagate uncertainty uh, very well. So it's easy to get estimates of uncertainty uh, for our, for uh, at whatever uh, level we want, whether the national or subnational levels, it's easy to quantify that uncertainty. And importantly, that uncertainty takes into account this adjustment for representativeness. And uh, actually methods like raking don't quite do that because uh, it's a two-step procedure. You generate the weights, and then you uh, gener get your estimates based on those weights. And raking assumes that those weights are fixed uh, fr from that first step, whereas in MRP, it's a one-step process, and the uncertainty propagates all the way through. And then the last advantage of MRP that we list here is that uh, it ends up giving much better performance, especially in subgroups. Uh, so the performance on the full population is relatively comparable to raking. Um, sometimes some have shown that's slightly better than raking, but it's really comparable uh, or on the same on the same level. But uh, but uh, it gives much better performance when you're looking at sub subgroups. Like what is the rate uh, among men or uh, or among uh, 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 poor poor women, uh, for example. Next. Um, so in order to sense, get a sense of how effective MRP is in adjusting for biases in S, in, in specifically in the SMS data, we looked at some indicators uh, where we already had a recent gold standard estimates. So Shirley showed some of these before. Uh, these are estimates based on large face-to-face -face surveys. And uh, what we found is that in some cases, when we applied MRP, that approach was not we were not able to replicate the previously known gold standard estimates. So in other words, uh, MRP, so we were producing some, uh, was producing biased estimates. Uh, the estimates tended to be a little less biased than, than the raked estimates and some other, or other approaches that we looked at, uh, but they still weren't close enough for us to, for to, us to consider them to be reliable. So our solution, um, and Shirley uh, talked about this, was to uh, bring in some face-to-face -face data and try to get sort of a best of both worlds approach. And the way it works is that we use this face-to-face -face data to calibrate our estimates. And at a high level, um, uh, what we have is the SMS data is used to really understand which of these cells have higher versus lower rates of the outcomes. 
Um, and then the face-to-face -face data is used to adjust uh, the level to each cell. Uh, I should mention, uh, so, why, so why was it that standard MRP wasn't working? Um, there were two reasons uh, that the standard MRP wasn't working. So it, it makes a couple of assumptions. Those assumptions being that there were no unobserved confounders and no survey mode effects. Uh, and these are particularly problematic for SMS surveys. Um, Shirley already talked about, uh, uh, sorry if you could go back, uh, talked about with SMS surveys, for one, you need access to mobile phones, you need to be literate. And while we can control uh, in some sense for literacy, if there are people, if there are, uh, you know, with mobile phone access, everybody who responds to an SMS survey has some sort of mobile phone access. So you can imagine uh, people with this that are otherwise similar, uh, same age, education level, et cetera, but one person does have access to mobile phones, other person doesn't, they might respond differently, especially if we're asking questions about something like digital financial inclusion, which is highly related to cell phone ownership. And the other is survey, no survey mode effects. And uh, these are particularly problematic for SMS surveys because, uh, be, because the, there's no person that the person can, that, uh, it, that the respondent is speaking to on the other end of the phone. So that makes it very different from either a face-to-face -face or a caddy situation because you can't ask clarifying questions. There's nobody there to make sure that the person is engaged in uh, giving truthful answers to the survey, et cetera. Um, Okay, so next next slide. So I'm gonna take you through an example of how this calibrated uh, MRP approach works, uh, where we combine SMS and face-to-face -face data. Uh, the first step is to combine the two data sets into one. So here's, here's an example where we have these two data sets. We have an SMS data set and a smaller face-to-face -face data, set, data set. So in the first step, we stack the two data sets together. So you can hit next, Shirley. Uh, where the two data sets are combined into a single data set. And so now we have uh, these four cells. We have, uh, we have information about all of them, uh, all of the people, whether they're, uh, what their gender or urbanicity is, but we also know what their uh, survey collection mode is. And then we fit a multi-level regression model where we take into account the survey mode. Uh, so, so it's not just going to include the two variables, gender and urban, urban rural, it's also going to include survey mode as a predictor in, in this model. But then when we uh, predict and when we estimate um, uh, these rates, we estimate specifically how a face-to-face -face respondent would have responded to, the, to this question. So these rates right here, 39, 66, 44, 72, those are, how a face-to-face, -face, how the model thinks a face-to-face -face person would have responded to this question on uh, do, you, uh, do, you have, uh, do you use mobile money? And then the final step, just like before, we post stratify using the same target population rates and we get uh, our, our final estimate. Uh, so, uh, so MRP uh, is a very effective method, as, as, and when we use um, when we use this calibrated MRP approach, we ended up getting uh, very very good results, as we'll see. Shirley showed a little bit of that before, and we'll see more of those results soon. But it does have its challenges. Um, so uh, there's two challenges that we're noting. One is that it's uh, essentially it's more work than approach like raking, and that's for two reasons. One, uh, so with raking, you typically estimate a single set of weights and you can apply those weights to all the outcomes in your survey. Here, we need to fit a separate, separate model for each outcome um, in, uh, that we are interested in. And each of these outcomes, uh, each of these models can be uh, pretty computationally intensive. Uh, so uh, uh, so that, is, that is one challenge. A second challenge is that we require more detailed information about the target population uh, than something like raking. So we're raking where you only need to know uh, the margins, which means you just need to know the proportion of the population that is in each age group. You need to know separately the proportion that is of each gender, proportion that has every education level. Uh, with MRP, you need to know the cell frequency. So that means you need to know the proportion of the population that is aged 30, 34 to 45, male, below the poverty line, living in the west region of the country, uh, et, et cetera. 
Um, so typically we need a good reference survey for, for this where we can calculate uh, where, where we can calculate them. Uh, now uh, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague uh, Constance, who's going to talk about uh, how we implemented this and how we solved some of these challenges. Yep. Thank you, John. Um, so as John mentioned, the models that we were running were quite compu computationally intensive. Um, so we've had to design a new new workflow for us to make this possible to even run them. Um, so our problem was that we had several models to run for each different type of indicators that we wanted to um, to model. And so in the end, we had about 80 models, uh, sometimes even more, and several iterations of each of those um, to run. And some of them would take more than an hour to run on our computers. Um, and in addition to this, because it's a Bayesian frameworks that relies on Markov chains, they're quite intensive. Um, as far as computing resources go. And so we found that it was quite difficult to run them on our own laptops while you know, doing other work. Um, so the solution that we found is that we moved all of our computing to the cloud and we did so in a way that was distributed. Um, and so more specifically, we used Amazon Web Services, AWS, um, with SageMaker. So those are cloud clients. Um, and together, these two services allowed us to distribute all of our computing jobs across different servers that we didn't own. Um, so it was quite nice to have to, to be able to use different computers and have access to as many as we wanted. Um, for relatively cheap. And so our framework was that each of the machines or computers that we had access to would run jobs in parallel. So each machine would run a single model on four cores because that's what's required uh, by the, the Bayesian framework that we used. And then because we had access to machines that had more cores, um, than our own computers, we could run multiple models on each of these machines. And then in addition to that, we also parallelized across machines. So, um, so that for instance, we would run all of the models for one country on a server, and then that server would run jobs in parallel. And so this whole framework allowed us to reduce our computing time from a week long, like seven or eight days to less than a day. Um, like some of them even run in like a few hours, which is great. Um, and someone, something else that I want to mention is that this uh, computing time is a function of the model framework that we used, um, but it's also a function of our um, data size. So with smaller data sets usually, the, these models run much faster, but because of the size of the data we had, it took more time. Um, so just want to throw this in there in case you want to use it with your own data. Uh, next slide, please. And so one of the core things we're also interested in was subgroups. Um, so these results that I just showed were overall the respondents, but we were also very interested in looking at poor rural women in particular and some other subgroups as well. And so this here shows results for subgroups, for this subgroup of poor rural women in Uganda. And so we have on the left, the leftmost bar is once again our benchmark using only face-to-face -face data. And then we used a raked face-to-face um, in the middle, just to compare how our calibrated MRP on the rightmost would do. And here we see that it's actually performing better than the raked face-to-face -face data. Um, and which shows that the strength of our method really lies in these subgroup analysis that we're able to do 
and that even if we have small sample sizes, we can still um, perform, you know, get quite accurate results. And the bars, the black bars um, with the dots in each of those are the credible intervals. And now I will turn it back to Bobby and Shirley. Thanks so much, Constance, and thanks so much, uh, John and Shirley. So um, we're, we're sort of getting to the summary again, and, and I think this um, overall picture that the presenters have shown is, is, is the, the background to our point about how this approach is an effective way for illustrating um, our goal of making sustainable development goal indicator collection sustainable. So we have taken you through a practical cost effective solution to reporting on SDG and other indicators. This can help you to get data quickly and cheaply in normal times and to collect rapid response surveys in unusual times such as 2020's COVID-19 pandemic. This practical cost effective approach enables us to provide accurate indicator reporting, reducing the bias of estimates, including in subgroups of interest. We have four key messages that we've taken you through today. The first is that good population estimates are critical. Recent powerful reference data is critical to, to the work. And this means that the large data sets of national statistical offices are so important. The second message is that modeling shows that the addition of just a small number of an appropriate face-to-face -face sample makes a big difference. Uh, our third message is that um, we've already identified examples of SDG indicator gaps that our calibrated MRP can bridge. This includes rural road access, violence, recycling rates, informal employment, safe drinking water, land ownership and poverty, uh, amongst many that, that are appropriate to, to surveys. Uh, our final message is that data partnerships with national statistical systems are going to amplify the importance of national statistical offices and identify how they will guide priority research going forward. Their benchmark face-to-face -face surveys can be appropriately bolstered and leveraged for optimizing partnership survey uh, efforts to deliver the future of cost-effective measurement. Uh, to start off, Rabia, I'd like to ask you um, what your responses to this presentation are and, and uh, further what you'd like to highlight as, as the key messages you've taken. And so it is, it is, it is giving us the idea that in future, uh, we can save resources and we can use this, uh, these methodologies uh, to estimate the results, uh, uh, different results, uh, different indicators, which, can, which we are not actually collecting the data. There are many indicators of SDGs for which it is, uh, we are unable to collect the data. These methodologies can be used uh, for uh, estimating uh, indicators, which will help us for the policy making. It's a wonderful idea, and uh, the key message is that we have to move uh, move now uh, instead of uh, uh, conducting survey for each and every indicator, we can use these methodologies. Um, Matthew Collins on Monday, and also just to ask him also what his responses to this presentation is, and, and if he'd like to highlight anything as key messages and, and, and areas for further information he might be interested in. Um, over to you, uh, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Bobby, and thank you, team. For me, first and foremost, it is an amazing, amazing, uh, amazing analytical tool because uh, when you look at uh, the, the findings, uh, it shows that uh, indeed the statistics uh, can be cheaper when you start using some of these tools. So to us, it's, uh, we were more of like learning in terms of the new tool. In Kenya, we managed to undertake two surveys for on the socioeconomic impact of COVID uh, in our households. And uh, basically these surveys, uh, these surveys were done in the month of May and the month of June. We've not been able to undertake one in July, August and September, uh, but uh, we hope that we'll be able to 
undertake one. But the, the key message in terms of this survey, we are just looking at the impact of COVID you know, in our household in terms of the jobs, uh, the number of job loss, the issues of food security, the, the issues of transport, the issues of health and education. So basically those are the areas that we are focusing in those. What kind of research do you think needs to be done to get a better sense of the appropriate mix of the, the cheaper data collection mode and face-to-face and, -face, um, and specific potentially to each sustainable development goal theme? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we have done uh, some of this work to try to understand what the optimal balance is between, uh, S, for example, SMS and face-to-face -to, -face to try to get the best results. Uh, uh, more work needs to be done. Specifically, uh, I think we need more simulations to try to understand under what, what scenarios uh, these approaches work. We, do, we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a good amount of real uh, data that's collected uh, from, SM, from S, SMS uh, data and face-to-face -face data that we can base these simulations on. But I think good simulation studies where uh, we understand well what this is the true rate. This is the, this is these are different scenarios that are realistic, um, realistic sampling uh, desi designs uh, to try and bringing in the cost information. For example, this this design we could do with this amount of SMS data, this amount of face to face data for this cost, uh, specifically in these markets. Uh, uh, or in, in these uh, areas of the country, for example. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we, we still have a little ways to go before we uh, have a full sense of, uh, of what these trade-offs are. Starting with uh, Rabia, could you tell me about the key national household data sets that external researchers and other organizations have been using? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to um, take one point from John, what John, Jonathan said, that for the simulations, you need a data, of course, a good reference database also. So uh, National Statistical Office, Pakistan Bureau of Statistics is uh, collecting data on household data uh, on one of the survey, which is called Pakistan Social and Living Standard Measurement Survey. It's the biggest survey at the district level, and it's used by all the international organizations like UFI, World Bank, and it is used, it is the main uh, survey also for the monitoring of the SDG indicators. It is collecting data from 195,000 households all over Pakistan. And it is also used for calculation of multidimensional poverty index. The other survey which we are doing is the Household Integrated Economic Survey. It's a nationally and provincially representative survey. It gives you a good information about the income and consumption along with other social economic, social demographic characteristics. Then we have the labor force survey. It is also the very uh, nationally representative, provincially representative survey give you the uh, um, labor market information and it is used by ILO, World Bank, and all the international organizations. So uh, these, these are the three main data set we, which we are producing continuously every year or, or, all the, or, or on the alternate basis. And it's used, uh, they are also used for the monitoring of SDGs. Um, and they are the rich data sets these data sets can be used as a reference period, uh, reference database for simulations, especially the PSLM data sets because it's very big data and it has a uh, lot of information like social, social information, social economic um, indicators. So that that is used by all the international organizations uh, for monitoring of SDGs and for poverty estimation, things like that. Give us insight into some of your key large-scale surveys that, that are being used by, by researchers um, looking into Kenya. Yeah, thank you. In fact, let me start with the most recent uh, data set that I can talk about. This is a Kenya population announcing census, which we did last year. This data set, I think, is one of the richest because it has a lot of indicators which can be used to monitor so many things, so many issues. and. Uh, it's also good in terms of the, the trying to monitor the SDG uh, the targets that we have and the indicators that inform the SDG. Then number two, there is a regular survey that we do on a monthly basis. This is called Kenya Continuous Household Survey 
household survey program. This is also another rich data set that we have. And uh, from this data set, we're able to come up with the, with the report uh, such as the quarterly, uh, the, the quarterly labor force uh, report that we produce on a quarterly basis. We also do our poverty indicators in this same 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 survey that we do. And also when you look at it, then uh, the issues of uh, consumption patterns, which are also key for the national accounts user. So uh, apart from that also, the other key survey or the other key, key data set that we talk of is uh, also surveys that we did uh, some times back. This is like 2015-16. Uh, this is a Kenya Integrated Household Budget Survey. This was more of also a key data set and it was rich in terms of the some of the indicators that it managed to collect. Uh, and, uh, a question or experience to sort of ask from you, and um, you'd gone on about the uh, computational intensity uh, and, and the challenge and, and how you'd got around it. Um, now I, I understand your setup work is being recognized and appreciated by uh, ac academics working in the MRP field who know all about these processing power and time issues. Um, are there any particular parts or even just one thing that you're, um, specifically proud about in terms of sorting out and discovering for your own workflow? Um, I think the biggest one thing was to just uh, put to work this very new and um, cutting, out, cutting out technology because um, SageMaker in particular is somewhat new um, and having to figure it out and the ease of running all of these models and the rapidity with which we were able to do it was um, definitely a big improvement on how we've done things in the past. And so, yeah, I would say leveraging all of this cloud technology was quite uh, novel and we've shown that it works, it works really well especially for these high intensive uh, computing requirements. And I'll add to that, uh, another thing that really helped was writing code that was uh, very streamlined. So, uh, so you can say, right, you know, I, I want to know uh, the estimates for this indicator. So fit the, fit the model with this variable and, and, and base in these, you know, these variables that we're adjusting for and, and let it run. That was especially helpful with the COVID tracker where we were trying to, where we have been turning around uh, results at a pretty high rate across a number of countries for, for, for a bunch of uh, indicators um, repeatedly. Um, so to start with you, Shirley, um, thinking about the future of research, what do you think are the big lessons from this research for future research for both normal times and pandemic times? Thanks, Bobby. Um, sure. <laughs> so I think for me, the big learnings here are that we really can use technology um, to, to collect more data, um, but we have to be very clever about it and we have to be very um, thoughtful in how we do that. So I think in COVID times, I think in a time like this, being able to use mobile phones to contact people is really useful. And um, it does provide us with data that can be used, can be used to make decisions. But of course, we do understand that we are missing a portion of the population. But going forward, I think it's really important to be monitoring and understanding what the, the penetration of this particular technology is in a particular market. Because as we can see in Kenya, where we know that um, mobile phone usage is actually very prolific, we get very, very good results from even a mobile only uh, method. Um, so with time and with understanding the actual markets, I think we will definitely get to a point where our sample optimization will really focus on really using the technology for the bulk um, and then only having to outlay a sm smaller amount of resource 
to actually get to those people who are still excluded by that approach. Um, thanks very much. I mean, uh, in terms of a final opportunity for, for Matthew, do you, do you have any thoughts, um, I suppose, based on this presentation and your, your recent experiences this year through the, the COVID um, pandemic in terms of the, the sort of where the future of research and, and changes that you are excited about or interested in happening? Thank, thank you, Bobby. I think one of the key things that, uh, one of the key lessons that we learned through the COVID is uh, that we need to embrace alternative uh, methods in terms of data collection. Because uh, you, during the restrictions, we saw that uh, people are not able to move. So we have to look for alternative way. And it has proved that uh, use of these alternative ways of data collection, like the use of uh, telephone interview, will be a, an alternative to, to be able to collect data. Then uh, the other key thing that I think is also important is we need to build capacity in terms of trying to, to use these new analytical tools that are in place now, so that we're able to at least equip countries or the statistical institutions with better ways of analysis or better ways in terms of doing, in, in, in terms of reducing on uh, the cost of data collection and also the time that it takes to be able to collect and analyze that data. So looking at all these methods, I think this is a key, key thing that we need to see how best we can be able to partner and be able to move forward with it. Then lastly, I think uh, it is important for us to think in terms of collaboration and partnering with various stakeholders so that we're able to see which are other ways in terms of the data collection, data analysis and all that. And through that, we'll be able to build capacity among each other and be able to see to it that uh, we improve on the statistical uh, ways in terms of data collection, data analysis, and uh, and data presentation going forward. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Matthew. And, and uh, Rabia, to end with you, uh, what um, based on your recent experiences and, and, and potentially lessons from this um, research, what do you see as, uh, as the future of, of research and, and I suppose areas that you'd like to be focused on in, in the future? Uh, thank you, Bob. Actually, uh, what, uh, the, uh, what Shirley has uh, um, said, that uh, the we need to shift to technologies, but then we have to be very clever and that the technologies used should be robust, that it should give us a uh, uh, timely and uh, curate estimates. Of course, the main problem is that, that uh, as time passes, it is difficult to get data from the face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, Non-responses uh, uh, becoming bigger and bigger. So, of course, the methodologies which we have to move in now is to use this smart methodologies. We can shift to CAPI or the uh, CATI approaches. So, I, I think uh, the the uh, now our should the lead is uh, the way is actually the use of the technology. Uh, slowly and steadily, we have to shift to that technology because um, it's very expensive to conduct the face face to face interviews also. Uh, thanks very much. I mean, if I can just emphasize what um, both Matthew and, and Rabia mentioned now, it's this idea of, of um, moving in, in the direction of technology, but moving in a sustainable way from um, where, uh, where the ecosystem and the national statistical organizations are. Um, and, and of course, um, ensuring that the skills and, and capacity gaps are, are filled um, and that and that this is achieved through partnership. So I think um, that summarizes the the perspective of this um, thematic area two um, of the UN World Data Forum, and and of course this this example of the work that we've done today. And I I'd, and I'd like to thank um, uh, my colleague at Finmark Shirley. I'd like to thank um, John and Constance from Mathematica, uh, and of course uh, Rabia from the Pakistan Bureau of Statistics, and Matthew Collins Amandi from the Kenya Statistics Bureau for um, partnering with us uh, today and and, um, uh, and 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 providing really great insights. Um, 
uh, to everybody. This is going to be a, a really great um, virtual data forum in the time of COVID-19. And we look forward to engaging with you and your um, colleagues and partners uh, through the, the virtual functionality.